uh, at the new school. Uh, at the new school, and uh, and we really haven't yet uh, talked about these mutual interests. So I think this is the perfect occasion, um, and so I'm really looking forward to thinking together with everyone. So um, let me start now. I'd say all roads lead to cooperation. Uh, over for me, over the past three years, all of my research has led me towards forms of cooperation rather than forms of competition uh, as the only way forward for our society and our world in its new and radical form of interdependence. Uh, and to my surprise, we are really surrounded by cooperation. Um, the fact is, cooperative enterprises flourish today, even in capitalist economies, and even though the entire weight of contemporary law, politics, and ideology presses against cooperation. Solidaristic arrangements can be found in many industries, and in some industries, they pretty much permeate the field. In many respects, they, they already, in, in many regards, outperform and outlast conventional uh, publicly traded firms in certain areas. Uh, they often uh, show themselves to be more resilient during economic downturns. And so we, we know and we're familiar with, although it's kind of hidden because, well, I'd say, I say we know, but on the other hand, we know of the existence uh, of these entities, but we often we don't look behind the, the veil to see how they're organized. Um, but cooperation does permeate the economy. You think about, you know, King Arthur flour. I mean, I know everybody's baking bread during the pandemic. Well, King Arthur flour is a, is a, is a, is a, is a form of a, a, it's an, a worker-owned uh, enterprise up in Vermont. Um, uh, Land of Lakes, um, you know, Sunkist, Ocean Spray are actually producer cooperatives. Uh, everybody knows REI, of course, which is a consumer cooperative. Ace Hardware uh, is actually a retailer uh, cooperative. Um, and then you have these large uh, worker cooperatives like Isthmus Engineering and Manufacturing in Madison, Wisconsin, or, or in the Bronx, a number of uh, operating cooperatives, cooperative home care. Um, AK Press uh, in California, and uh, and banks too. Um, the Navy, the Navy Federal Credit Union, which has only twenty five billion dollars in assets and eight million members, is a member of credit union. And of course, we have nonprofit educational, cultural, and social institutions that work on models of cooperation. The insurance industry. Uh, for instance, has always been home to large and resilient mutualist uh, societies. Benjamin Franklin actually founded the oldest property insurance company in the country, um, a mutual that's uh, that considered the first recognized cooperative business in the United States. And half of the largest 10 property and casualty insurance companies today are mutuals. Uh, together, um, the, 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 those, the, the, the five large Mutual insurance companies serve 25% of the entire market. Uh, so, and most of the household names in insurance companies that we know, State Farm, Liberty Mutual, New York Life, Nationwide, Northwestern Mutual, Mutual of Omaha, these are all mutuals and are extremely resilient. Uh, the median age of a US mutual insurance company is about 120 years. Uh, so we've got farmer and producer cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, worker cooperatives, uh, retailer cooperatives that are really thriving uh, across the economic sector today. Uh, again, despite the fact that pretty much most legal tax and policy uh, dimensions are stacked against them. Uh, and, 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 um, and so, and, and, and most of the kind of the, the tax code is actually unfavorable and instead favors capital uh, accumulation rather than cooperative enterprises. So it's quite surprising that cooperatives in the United States actually survive uh, through their first six to 10 years at a rate that's 7% higher uh, than traditional small businesses. Now, um, cooperatives can also thrive in the financial sector. Um, where credit unions uh, developed starting in the 1920s with the Massachusetts Association of Credit Unions, and then in 1935, 34, with the federal laws, 
enabling uh, the formation of credit unions. Credit unions gained really lasting status by surviving the Great Depression and the final financial crises of the 1980s. And today uh, have more than 100 million members in the United States. In a country like France, uh, across the pond, uh, the Crédit Agricole Group, uh, which is formed by 39 regional uh, cooperative banks, uh, each of which, each of which of those 39 regional banks are full-fledged cooperative entities. They serve over 21 million customers, has over 9.3 million member clients at the local level. Crédit Agricole actually has about 23.3% of French household deposits, so about a quarter of French household deposits with total assets of 1.7 trillion euros. So these are big enterprises that run on cooperative and mutualist um, principles. Um, the, some, some of these enterprises can be as large as multinationals. The, one of the most famous one, of course, is the Mondragon uh, Cooperative Consortium, well known by most people. In fact, there's, there's even a Mondragon University now. Um, but the, the consortium itself, uh, which is uh, headquartered in Spain, it's a diversified enterprise that engages in manufacturing of heavy equipment. Um, and they employ over 70,000 workers uh, and they bring in annual revenues uh, in the billions of euros. And, you know, they, they, can, uh, they can really grow to size. <coughs> and uh, in some cases, they can really dominate the competition and be technical, logical leaders in their field. So another uh, worker cooperative in Sheffield, England, Swan Morton, for instance, is a world leader in manufacturing and selling surgical blades and scalpels and exports to over 100 countries around the globe. Uh, that one, uh, Swan Morton, was founded in 1932. Uh, on the principle that uh, claims of individuals uh, producing in the industry must come first. And uh, they have annual estimated revenues in the range of uh, $15 million today. Uh, so there are these uh, myriad enterprises based on cooperation run by and for members, workers, producers, or consumers that really fuel the economy uh, and defy uh, the logics of capital. Not all of these cooperatives are necessarily model organizations, and several suffer from what's been called decooperative phases. Uh, so actually, Crédit Agricole has kind of, it's got its 39 uh, fully uh, cooperative entities, but it's also raised capital on the capital markets. And so some of these enterprises become somewhat mixed or hybrid as they grow. Um, but these are all models that are tried and true and pretty simple um, in terms of the corporate finance. And they could serve as an exemplar for a society based on cooperation. So I think it's clear from what exists already that a future based on cooperation is no mere fantasy. Uh, and that cooperationist enterprises do surround us today and thrive. Now, I started by saying all roads lead to cooperation. That was somewhat a dramatic uh, way to start the conversation. Um, but I would say many different roads have led to cooperation over the past centuries. Um, now, and not all of those roads are roads that we need to take today, um, in part because I think we are uniquely situated today because of the global climate crisis and the fact that as a result of this uh, looming crisis, we are far more interdependent as people, as nations, uh, than we've ever been before. And I think that has changed things. Uh, and it means we need to come to cooperation somewhat differently uh, than others may have in the past. Now, at the turn of the 20th century, the Russian polymath, Pyotr Alexeyevich Kropotkin, who we know as Peter uh, Kropotkin uh, in the US, uh, attempted to prove as a scientific matter that solidarity, uh, that uh, cooperation rather than competition 
was central to animal flourishing and evolution, including human evolution. Uh, now, and although Kropotkin was not literally responding to Charles Darwin, he was actually responding uh, to an essay by Thomas Huxley called The Struggle for Existence, Kropotkin was clearly making a scientific evolutionary argument in the wake of Darwinian theory. And he published his writings, he wrote many articles, he published them in 1902 under the title Mutual Aid, a Factor for Evolution. Now, Kropotkin's work has received increasing attention, uh, including in mainstream media, as a result of the flourishing of mutual aid projects during the COVID pandemic recently and also as a result of the important writings of Dean Spade, a lawyer activist and critical theory who authored in 2020 a, a, a how-to manual really titled Mutual Aid Building Solidarity During This Crisis and the Next. Um, so we now have you know, accounts of uh, Kropotkin's work uh, in, the, in the media, in the New Yorker magazine, for instance. I mean, the, that's how the New Yorker describes Kropotkin as having identified solidarity as an essential practice in the lives of swallows and marmots and primitive hunter-gatherers. Corporation, cooperation, he argues, was what allowed people in medieval villages and 19th century farming syndicates to survive. And that inborn solidarity uh, was undermined, in his view, this is still you know, the, the, the media presentation of his work, by the principle of private property. Um, and uh, and so he favored mutual aid. Yeah. So we've 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 gotten. I mean, Kropotkin in a way has entered the um, the discourse, the, the 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 public discourse today. I think, um, and is a central figure for for many thinkers, uh, many anarchists. In particular, Kropotkin himself was an anarchist, uh, but many thinkers who are thinking about mutual aid forms of mutual aid that don't necessitate as much um, state intervention. Um, now, the problem, of course, with Kropotkin's argument is that uh, few of us, at least, uh, I don't know, well, maybe I'm speaking for myself, maybe not for, for, for everyone in the audience here, because this is a pretty stellar, uh, the, the Committee on Global Thought is a pretty stellar group, but I know I, I am not a biologist and I, I know I don't have sufficient competence or scientific training to judge the kind of evolutionary uh, contentions, which are clearly um, at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a high level uh, of scientific demonstration. And so, I mean, my sense is, at least for myself, that I can't really place my trust in, 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 in science that I, that I can't test and and um, but that even more than that though the the evolutionary science or at least the ways in which uh, we speak about cooperation uh, in the evolutionary science context um, is somewhat is somewhat different I think than how we need to approach it today because we are in a different space today uh, than uh, Kropotkin was uh, who was writing in the late 19th century. I mean, we're in a world today in which we, <laughs> humans, all of us have inalterably affected our own object of study. Uh, in other words, um, in other words, with the, the, the earth, right? We, we have transformed things in such a way uh, and we have created forms of interdependence that probably Kropotkin could not even have imagined in 1890. Uh, and so having created our own kind of mutual interdependence, this means that now we really need to choose cooperation, not as something that is a question of natural selection, uh, but really as our only path forward. Um, we have transformed our natural environment in such radical ways uh, that our own survival as a species is now far more dependent on our decisions, uh, and less so on a naturalistic ecological model regarding swallows or marmots. Um, so climate change, I would argue, has effectively uh, shifted things so that now, with our independence, uh, it calls for cooperation regardless of, of the natural selection science. Um, 
And, and I think that it's the, those principles of cooperation, the, the fundamental ones. I mean, and, and, and they've, been, uh, they've existed since the 19th century. You have the UN uh, guidelines on, on issues of cooperatives, et cetera, um, which uh, tie very well to the, to the 19th century principles that were developed in some of the early cooperatives, but basically open and voluntary membership, democratic member control of the enterprise, participation in the enterprise, autonomy and independence, and that these, these mirror uh, the principles of cooperatives that have emerged in the literature on cooperation. Um, and, uh, and it characterized, I think, the kind of structures that we need to put in place. Um, now, uh, and, and that will, I believe, uh, deal with uh, creating a sustainable living environment and also address uh, uh, crises such as uh, COVID and other pandemics. Um, and I don't think it's a surprise that uh, mutual aid projects have really arisen organically throughout the United States in response to the pandemic. Now, I had promised, and I've got four minutes left, I had promised to tie this to the worldly philosophers and to the seminar, this uh, the public seminar this year, that's called uh, Revolution 1313, um, which is focusing on the differences between what uh, could be called, uh, and uh, here I'm, I'm following, you know, a, a terrific scholar by the name of Yudun Jayifo up at, uh, at Harvard, who was trying to draw a distinction uh, as we were talking about particular practice between the worldly philosophers and more academic, critical philosophers. Uh, and the worldly philosophers are the ones who think who, who are not so much in the academic setting or in the academy or doing you know, work for other academics, but are are writing for a, a general public uh, and trying to transform the world. I think Kropotkin was clearly a, a worldly philosopher. Many of the people who have been behind cooperative movements have been what I would call worldly philosophers. Charles Fourier in France or Robert Owen, uh, both uh, industrialists. Well, uh, Robert Owen was an industrialist from the 19th century. Um, he actually started a New Harmony in Indiana, which was intended to be kind of like a cooperative uh, city. Uh, those utopian socialists who advocated for cooperatives in the 19th century, lots of problems with uh, them that I, I, I don't want to kind of carry their luggage for them, uh, but they were uh, worldly philosophers. So was W.E.B. Du Bois, actually, who in 1935, although he's situated somewhat differently uh, with the academy, uh, since he, at various points in his life, was in the academy. Right in 1935, he argued for African American cooperatives as the only way forward. In the event, this year in the 1313, we're trying to study these world thinkers uh, by contrast to our usual suspects like Foucault 1313, Nietzsche 1313, critical philosophers who are more closely associated with uh, academic thinking. And the original question in that series was really how do the subtle differences between them, uh, between on the one hand worldly philosophers and on the other hand academic scholars, give us a purchase on the question of critique and praxis and the questions of what, you know, what is to be done. And my thinking on this has evolved over the semester um, but I'm at this point right now, I think, uh, and this is what ties in precisely with these questions of cooperation, where uh, I would say um, what differed with the worldly philosophers were three things. First, the people that they surrounded themselves with. Um, and so these were the worldly philosophers, much more activists and organizers, um, the doers uh, rather than uh, academics. Second, the audience that they were addressing. And here, I, I think it's fair to say that they had the, the public as an audience rather than uh, any particular academic discipline or academic discourse. And the third is the objective that they had in mind, which really um, was to change the world. Um, the objective is less to 
impart knowledge or form future teachers and scholars. Uh, the objective, it, it seems, for the world of philosophers is to change the world. And it's in that sense I think, that we need to rethink a little bit our own role uh, as, as scholars but located in the academy. And, um, and, it's in, in, and it's through that lens that I've begun to think more and more about uh, cooperation uh, and, and, and to think about who, who should be the audience for this um, and who should I surround myself with um, and what objective should I have in mind, uh, which may be not simply to research and demonstrate, um, but to help um, create a world of cooperation. So let me stop there and turn it to David uh, for comments, who, who is doing that, I think, uh, precisely through the Institute uh, for the yeah. Cooperative Digital Economy. Thanks so much. No, thank you. Fantastic, thanks, Bernard. Um, I mean, there's just a whole wide range of, of questions, but actually, let me start with this quote. I think you'll find this interesting. So someone said, cooperative societies bring forth the best capacities, the best influences of the individual for the benefit of the whole, while the good influences of the many aid the individual. So it's sort of interesting when you hear that, who would say something like that? Um, would it be you know, a philosopher would be um, a sort of an activist thinking about um, kind of the workers. Uh, but actually, the person that said that was Leland Stanford back in October 1 of 1891. And you alluded to a lot of this because a lot of the folks that you brought up was also at the, the turn of the century. And we think about the turn of the century, it was the beginning of the corporation um, and the legal structure that allowed the corporation to be what it is. And we have, you know, our colleague and friend, Katharina Pistor talks about kind of the, the codification that certain, um, the, the legal aspects um, privilege some aspects of capital of, over the other. So it's interesting to think about not only kind of the, the historical evolution, the intellectual evolution of cooperation, but if you sort of put it within the corporation and the evolution of the corporation and sort of the financial institutions that were then there to support that growth um, and also the legal structure. So it's interesting because uh, the reason I bring up Stanford is if you think about the place that is literally creating these new companies that have a lot of the sort of the, the, the initial um, sort of ambitions to, you know, like Google to, to not do any evil, it's interesting if you talk to the founders very early on, I think they would actually gravitate a lot to kind of the cooperative mindset that what Leland um, was sort of advocating. Uh, but it's interesting that as soon as they get and they form a corporation and what's then codified as that legal structure, what then ends up happening is you have to say, I'm gonna have certain equity. Who is going to have equity in this company, the founders have certain equity. And then from that point on, as capital then flows into that company, uh, you, know, you get less shares of within that company, but again, the value of that company grows. And it's interesting that it's not until you know, it goes public that you, know, you can then buy into that company where you get some shares. But again, if you think about the folks that are then um, I think contributing and now more so in the digital era, if you think about what makes Twitter valuable, it's the users. What makes Facebook valuable, it is the end users. Yet there seems to be no mechanism that allows those folks to really benefit unless you were a shareholder. I think that's why it's so interesting that cooperatives that you can sort of get and start at the very beginning when you are incorporating not to incorporate as a C corp, but then potentially incorporate as a co-op. So I think the kind of the legal dimensions are incredibly important and how the state privileges one over the other, um, um, I think can play a critical role. So I think, you know, with your legal background, the organizational, and also I think the philosophical, I think having you engage, I think in this conversation, um, both on the intellectual, but I think on the activist side, I think it, um, Will be will be tremendous. Um, so I'm really excited uh, for your participation uh, in this. So let me stop. I'm, I'm not sure if there's any 
sort of comments that you have, but I also really want to open up to um, uh, everyone that, that's here and then really get engaged in that conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would I'd love to hear from everyone who's here. So I encourage everyone to kind of turn on your, your cameras also so we can yeah. get a bit of a seminar uh, atmosphere, environment, and, um, and, and, and raise your hands. Maybe, I don't know, Kevin, if you're going to be... Um, or, or David, are you going to? Mm -hmm. Yep, I'll monitor. Yep. People who, you know, but um, it's interesting what you were saying about the transformation, and I think that that's really important. Um, which is the the kind of the structural transformation of the enterprise, and then how it affects the um, the distributions. I mean. It makes me think. I mean, and so and 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 I, I think I agree with you that a lot of time the originating um, ambition behind many of these enterprises is it is it has kind of forms of cooperation in mind, um, but then as the enterprise might structurally change in terms of its uh, legal form, uh, things will change and. And I, and I wonder if that has something to do with the fact that as value is created, right, then the question becomes, you know, who gets to extract that value and how is the value extracted? And I suppose it's, it's once the value is created, uh, so once a, you know, an enterprise like an incipient Google or, or any of the, um, you know, any of these, dot coms and, and, and startups that are all over, at least for our for our graduates, right? Like so many of our graduates are now actually not looking for employment, but looking to start one of these enterprises, right? But the question is, I think that, that starts probably with a lot of cooperation in mind. But one thing is like once the value is created and there's value to be like, seized or distributed or figured out how it gets distributed, but that's when kind of, that's when there's going to be kind of the, uh, it's going to be the toughest moment for that, for any cooperative ambition. And it's likely the moment where, you know, the value gets extracted through the shareholder, right? Rather than necessarily the folks who are working in the enterprise or something like that. Yep. Um, so I think you're right that it would be really important to look at, to study the kind of, history, legal history, et cetera, of how these enterprises, you know, begin with cooperation and ambition, um, but might or might not be able to fulfill them. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And sort of just following up then, I'll open up to, to everyone else. Again, one sort of additional evolution was then the B Corp, the Benefit Corp. Um, right. And it was sort of interesting that Etsy was the first B Corp to actually go public. Um, but then again, when really the push came to shove and their numbers and their revenue was dropping, you actually had a hedge fund, you know, I think acquire a, a decent amount. And again, from their point of view, they, they are, everyone has a fiduciary duty for the people that own the company. So you're talking about kind of cooperative. There is one element of a cooperative, which is, is the people, the shareholders, they are, the, the owners of that company and they have a fiduciary duty to provide as much value for you know that mini cooperative which is the the owners of that c corp so when that happened they laid off a lot of folks and it was sort of interesting that again even with all the benefits of a b corp but really the b corp has no real um uh kind of state sanctioned authority just saying i adhere to these values i'm gonna then you know, sort of like a good um, housekeeping seal, you get that label put on. But again, at the end of the day, when it gets to the, the legal structures, they were not able to, I think, kind of uphold their values as a B Corp. They had to, you know, really focus on on the revenue, um, right. which is interesting. And it, it it has to do with all of the different, in a, in a sense, it has to do, I think, with all of the different constituents uh, who form part of the entity and the way in which i mean the the mini cooperative that you were talking about of course is the the cooperation of the shareholders but then but that but that is 
limited in such a way then that the you know the the persons who are working at the corporation are not are no longer part of the ambition of uh, of cooperation there, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So love to open it up and you know feel free to to raise your hand or put something in the chat and happy to share that with the um, with the group here. Or we can make it like a law school seminar and actually call on folks, right, Bernard? <laughs> no, but please. We actually, that's a class. That, that's, a, that's a law school. Uh, that's a Socratic method in yes. a large class. We traditionally <laughs> don't do that in the small center. So. <laughs> but um, I mean, I wonder, like, what, what experience do people have with cooperatives, right? Um, yeah. And what... And what is the experience that you're having with the cooperative digital, um, uh, it, with that, in the in the digital space, uh, right? How is that? How is that working? Um, uh, it's limited to the digital. I take it the, right. the, the project. Is that right? And um, and is it is it is it uh, in, and how is it function? How is it functioning in terms of um, is it is it is it startups that are operating in cooperatives or 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 what is it exactly? What are the entities that are that are doing that work? Does anyone want to chime in? So maybe Kevin, I mean, you know, you're, you're you know, political economist. Um, oh, sorry. yeah, please. Akbar? Yes, hi. Uh, very much. Um, just a thought, I mean, thank you for a, a very stimulating uh, talk uh, and comments. But, you know, instead of saying all roads lead to competition, to cooperation, uh, would it be also, could it also be said all roads lead to either competition or cooperation. Mm -hmm. As two kind of, you know, the fundamental things in human beings, it's between altruism and selfishness, between the group with which we cooperate and the group which has the other. And the other is the one we kind of, you know, compete with uh, and with uh, within the group. So the rise of identity politics in this day to day in particular leads one to you know, make that kind of observation yeah that's really interesting um uh, I, I i have three thoughts here um so one is that um so one concerns the question of whether in a way cooperation and competition are the kind of two options that fill the whole field in a way right um, and I, I think I'm thinking of that in the same way you are, uh, in that it's 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 got to be either it feels as if it's got to be either one or the other, um, and of course, what's interesting about cooperatives, by contrast, say to something like, and I'm just going to use the term, although I have a problem with it, you know. I have a problem, well, I have a larger, not, not a problem with it, but with, with the label or the way we think about the label, but by comparison to say socialism or communism, right? Um, what's interesting about cooperation in through cooperatives is that, um, is that it assumes that there is still going to be some kind of competition, right? In other words, um, REI is a co-op, is a, is, a, is, a, is a consumer cooperative, but it's operating in a, in a competitive environment. And, and cooperatives can operate in competitive environments. In other words, if we, if we go buy our clothes at REI, we're not buying it, say, we're not buying it from an, another cooperative, right? Um, and all of the cooperatives that uh, I've mentioned you know, you know, need to support themselves in the sense that they need to 
compensate all the workers, you know? And so King Arthur Flower is competing with other entities, some of which may be cooperatives, but some of which are not cooperatives, right? Some of which are classic publicly held corporations, some of which are family owned corporations, et cetera. So, so what's, what's uh, and I don't, so I don't have answers, okay? But I, I, I think it's interesting to think about what role is there for some competition even within the world of cooperation, okay? Um, why would we buy King Arthur flour rather than other, other bread making flowers, even if some of them are cooperatives? Okay, so that's, so that's one question. I, so, and, so, and so just thinking about what you were asking, all, all roads lead to cooperation or competition. I suppose the question is, what is the, what role for competition within a cooperative society would be interesting to me. Now, um, now the, the second thing I wanna say was about identity politics. I think that's a fascinating question. And actually the last session we had for our public seminar, Revolution 413, the idea of 1313 is that there are 13 of them, which works well with the semester because there are 13 of them, so it always works well. But um, 413 was actually on the Combahee River Collective Statement, which was a, uh, a, a statement, uh, you could call it a manifesto, written by a, a, a group uh, that was the Combahee River Collective, which was a group of uh, women, uh, Black feminists. Black feminist women, and it was written in 1977. And it was actually the first document that used the term identity politics. Um, and so, and it is a document that is very, um, that is very identity oriented. Actually, um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw in the chat here, the, let me throw in the chat here, the, do I have, yes, I, let me just throw in the chat. It's going to take me a split second to throw in the chat the link to that seminar, which I think is, I, I, well, at least I think uh, I wrote about identity politics for that seminar in, in the blog. And so if you're interested in that, it's in the blog here. Um, I'm throwing it in the chat. Um, okay. Now, um, and, 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 um, and on the side of that, there's this uh, identity politics in the company we reflected. Now, um, here's what I was thinking though. You were suggesting, and you were suggesting that in identity politics, there is a notion of competition, which is, which is interesting. Um, in other words, uh, you were suggesting that identity politics works in a way by opposing one identity to the other possibly in a bit of a zero sum game or something like that. So it's like, you know, well, we need to, we need to pay attention to black feminists or, you know, because otherwise, et cetera, otherwise. Uh, now, now, my question there is whether it really is a zero sum game or whether we should think about it in terms of identity, whether we should think of identity as a zero sum game. And, um, I, I, this is interesting how it ties together to cooperation, but I, I actually don't think that we necessarily need to think of identity politics as being a zero sum game because it could be, and, and this is, well, this is about coalition building. Um, and the idea of coalitions is that, I mean, coalitions of different persons of different identities can work together towards an aspiration of you know helping persons from different but helping people in the coalition that doesn't necessarily have to think of it as a zero sum game even though it 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 is in certain respects all right so this this, this is confusing and i'm sorry let me just try and be as clear as i can be i think it's right that there is an element of zero sumness in the sense that any any distribution of a dollar is either going to go, you know, to one person, say, or to another. And in that sense, it's zero sum. Um, but 
But I'm wondering if when you have coalition politics between identities, you're thinking about the bigger objective of protecting everyone within the, the coalition, whether that is actually, you're, 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 you're no longer concerned with that, that dollar, that distribution, you're more concerned about protecting people in, in, in a coalition. Okay, sorry. Um, sorry, I, I hope that makes some sense at least, or maybe, maybe, maybe there's something in there that's worth retaining or thinking about. But, I guess it's maybe, yeah, it's, yeah, it's the one comment to, to yeah. Akbar's yeah. point. Um, I think it's sort of interesting if you are asking that question, just thinking about what level of aggregation you're asking that question, right? So if you think about uh, also then thinking about, are you the, the producer, the consumer or owner, the CEO of the company, or actually maybe you are the mayor of a city and it's, you know, when and where do you want competition and cooperation? So it's not either, potentially either, or it's potentially much more of a sort of a dynamic sort of system. Um, and there's a much longer conversation around that, but let me yeah. um, just kind of put that for some food for thought, but open it up for other folks to maybe ask yeah. some questions. Yeah, and while people are, are raising their hands and, and thinking about the question they want to ask. I think that actually, thanks, David, because that really tied it back to cooperatives in mm -hmm. a way. Um, and so the, the, the same thing that we were talking about identity politics, you could think about it in the context of cooperatives. If you think, for instance, okay, so, you know, we make revenue, let's say, you know, we make revenue. Who, how do we distribute it to workers, to, you know, to, to, you know, or, or to shareholders if you're not in a cooperative. Like that decision, I take it, is in a way zero sum because there's only a certain amount of, but if the ambition is to be in a cooperative where everybody has it, you know, you're, while there is a zero sum issue or dimension, at the same time, there is this shared collective ambition. And so it ends up not being a zero sum game because of, the fact that the ambition uh, is fulfilled. So through democratic participation, through, um, through democratic decision-making, through compensating uh, individuals and living yeah. wages or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then again, there's the whole work by Yokai Benkler and open source economics. And it's, you know, the rise of really, it was a cooperative to create you know, all these open source software uh, like Linux, like Apache web server, um, which was um, quite, quite fascinating. But I think one of the critiques about Bankler, especially in the cooperative world is that it's great that you had folks creating this, but they were all doing this really in their own free time. The folks that did it did not really get any of the value. So Red Hat became a consulting company that went public and was providing value by deploying uh, Linux, but again, if you think about all the people that contributed to it, there was really no mechanism for them to get any sort of value uh, for the time that they put in. And that's where it becomes very interesting now with blockchain, you know, the DAOs, the, the distributed autonomous organizations and the governance structure. And now even with sort of the NFTs, with more on the creative economy side, there are now potentially interesting mechanisms that could make this a lot more feasible. So again, if you had these mechanisms in place, let's say for Linux, you could literally, if it was on the blockchain, you could quantify potentially what you contributed to the source code and that's immutable. So then when people are then, you know, extracting value out of Linux, you would actually get, you know, with Ethereum potentially in place, it's all literally pre-distributed and you would get, just like a regular shareholder getting dividends, you would get um, some profit royalties. return to you. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like royalties, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we're just kind of scratching the surface of now with some of the underpinnings of sort of Web 3.0, where we could be moving, um, you know, in the space. So it's, it's quite fascinating. Right, right, right. So I know we only have five minutes left. We'd love to hear from some other folks. Kevin. Yeah, Kevin, please. Yeah, and, you know, sorry to kind of uh, put myself out there in that regard. Um, yeah, so I, 
you know, you, you're speaking, and first of all, thank you for this very stimulating presentation. Um, you're speaking primarily in terms of cooperation, although you did also use the term solidarity at some point. And so I, I'm wondering what the difference is between those terms and kind of a conceptual level, um, and, and if there is a difference, and if so, how meaningful that difference is. And part of what spurred me to ask that question is that you know, I would imagine that a lot of the thinkers that you're reading from in the context of the Revolution 1313 series would be speaking more a kind of language of solidarity than perhaps using the term cooperative. And so I'm kind of wondering about the, the politics of that linguistic choice. Great, yeah, thanks. Um, great question. And uh, this is a great conversation. Thanks, uh, Akbar, David, Kevin, this is great. Um, so that's that's a, that's a, that's that's uh, that's marvelous. Is solidarity has a different linguistic history, um, and has been much more tied to communalist political enterprises. Um, although not, I mean, I mean, and but yes and no, right? Also anti-communalist, and you know. Polish uh, solidarity uh, movement, right? But um, a bit, although even there, I mean, one would have to wonder where the communality is actually, on which side was it, right? Um, but, um, but it's true that the notion, the word, the term solidarity is more often appropriated or used in the context of, um, left political uh, movements that are more associated with a kind of socialist or communist uh, dimension than something like cooperatives and cooperation. Um, so, so there's no doubt that there is that, there is that history. Now, although, although, and then the term cooperation, um, tends in a way to have a valence that is more anarchist. And if, if I had to give it a kind of a political valence, it, it tends to be associated more with anarchist projects. Kropotkin was an anarchist. Um, and um, and uh, David Graeber, who uh, the famous anthropologist passed away recently, but who's actually who was who wrote a new preface that the book of mutual aid is coming out again with a new preface. He was an anarchist. So there's a sense in which oftentimes that tilts in that political direction. But I would say that neither neither term though necessarily has a, a political direction. Um, I would say that cooperation, well, cooperation is a term I've been trying to use because I don't think that cooperatives, cooperatives alone uh, is, is what we're talking about. I think, so cooperatives alone seems too small bore. One form of cooperation is cooperatives, but, um, but, but mutuals and, and, and other ways to organize work. So, so I like the cooperation rubric because it includes more things such as cooperatives, et cetera. And I, and I think that cooperation is solidaristic, um, uh, but I don't, but I wouldn't want to buy into, well, but I wouldn't want to buy into a notion either of cooperation or of solidarity that is uh, necessarily associated with socialism or communism. And here my problem is not with socialism and communism, but actually with the labels um, in the sense that um, I, 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 I actually, so I, I wrote a book called The Illusion of Free Markets. It was intended to also be the illusion of communism in a sense. Um, the argument is not just that free markets are an illusion, but that uh, the idea of kind of a state controlled economy is an illusion also. My, my idea is that all political economy is regulated, deeply regulated 
uh, by, by the state, by private actors, et cetera. You can't get away from regulation. And so, and so um, my critique uh, is that actually socialism and communism are just other forms of regulatory mechanisms where the right of property ownership goes to some other entity. Um, and so that's, 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 so that's part of this intervention. It would take a little bit, it would, since we were already at one, it would take way too much time to try and explain that. But, um, but the point there being that I think that one can have a notion of cooperation through the lens of a particular regulatory form where the beneficiaries and the holders are the people who kind of work or consume or insure themselves or something like that, uh, which would be just one regulatory form in a, in a, in a regulatory space that has all of these other options. Um, if that, if that, hopefully that makes sense. I'm sorry, I kind of threw in a, a, a huge issue uh, at the end, um, but yeah, yeah. But That's thanks for it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and those words are are tricky. I, I know we're one minute over. I'll just I'll, I'll finish by saying the, the selection of words is tricky here because the, there's cooperation, there's cooperatives, there's solidarity, there's mutuals, there's collectivities. Each one has a particular political balance, and um, uh, I'm trying to avoid as much as possible falling into old uh, traps. Uh, but to think instead about cooperation more, more broadly. <laughs> That's great. Well, I think a, a trade of a really good CGC lunchtime seminar, it just feels way too short. And you right. feel like you could have this conversation go not only for hours, but for days. Um, and this really was just, I think, a, just a great initial conversation, but hopefully it's just seeded a lot of other questions and thoughts for, for everyone. So I just want to thank you, Bernard. Thank you, um, David. And thank yeah. everyone for, for participating and joining this conversation. Yeah. Thanks, thank everyone. And Ava, thank you. Yes, thank you both so much. A hearty virtual round of applause. Very much enjoyed this conversation. I'm sure everyone else did as well. And I also wanted to thank um, one of our MA students, uh, Eva Stojanovic, for helping to coordinate and Thanks. manage this event. Yeah. Thank um, you. And so I'll just point out that, you know, this is part of a broader series. Um, please follow the CGT to learn about future events. Um, and for faculty who are interested in speaking at future events, please reach out to us. So thank you so much to everybody for joining us this afternoon um, for our lunchtime seminar. Um, and, you know, hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, we'll be able to have a kind of physical lunchtime seminar where actual lunch is involved as well. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Kevin.